2007 or so, maybe 2006. And that's when I began breaking out of this little bubble that we call software development. Prior to that, I've been, I got my first job in quote unquote software as a software tester around 1998. I was working at Microsoft as a contractor, uh, did, had no idea what software testing was, it was just what they had available. And a friend that had more tattoos and piercings than it's probably wise for anybody, no matter what age, got me a job there. Fell in love with it, but it was sort of a bubble. So my experience, my background that I came from was from liberal arts. I am sociology, history, English. Uh, I'm used to having a wide variety of subjects to look at. Suddenly I'm in the middle of this world, little cocoon world that talks about engineering, math, and science. And that's about it. And science, of course, has like giant air quotes around it. And that will get it. If you want to talk about that, please go to Cast in New York. I have a whole talk about that. Hopefully, they'll take. Um, but they, most of what they do is involved with this little microcosmic world that we call computer software and computer software engines and hardware and things of that nature. And, they, and you need to be, because this is an incredibly imprecise and strange thing. And you have to sort of focus in on it. One of the things that does to you is you start to forget, and I just lost my code, okay? Anyway, you start to focus in on the things that, you, that I would like to call the known knowns and the unknown knowns. As in, uh, I'm stealing from somebody who I'm not going to quote because this is Seattle and you may throw things at me. But he <laughs> talked about, there's like four things that we can do. There are, there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, there are unknown knowns, and there are unknown unknowns. And at first that seemed really trite to me, but then as I began to think about it, it began to make sense. When you're working with software, most of the things that we are working with are going to be known knowns. That is, these are problems we know, problems we understand, problems we've solved in the past. We know what we're doing. We can step in and go, yes, I can do that. We also have unknown knowns. These are the things that kind of resemble the stuff that we know. These are the technical problems, these are the software, these are the languages we don't understand. Maybe they're the architectural structures we've never used before. But they're unknown, but they're kind of known at the same time. The other things we don't generally deal with, which are the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. But right now, we're just going to focus on the one piece for this talk, which is what I'm sort of starting to term the uh, the known unknown. Sorry, I lost my card. When I first began running into that, as I said, it was back in 2007. And that's when I began leaving the world of software development and stepped into the world of banking. Uh, I got thrust into the Federal Home Loan Bank of Seattle, which is, if you knew what it was, you would be scared, but you shouldn't be. Um, it's a sort of a layer underneath the banks that you know. Bank of America, Washington Mutual, oh, sorry, not Washington Mutual anymore. Uh, Bank of America, Chase, whatever. And their charter is to provide a cushion for them uh, in case there is a massive failure. One of the reasons we didn't have a massive meltdown of our financial system like they did in Europe and in Asia was because of this system underneath it. So they are banks, but they are banks for banks. And they sit between the bank and the Federal Reserve. And they act as sort of, like I said, they act as a cushion and a buffer. I was tossed into that. So. <coughs> Picture in your head who I'm working with. These are bankers for other bankers. How geeky do you think they were about finance? They were massively geeky. So I had to know, I had to start learning phrases and terms I've never heard before, and I thought I was kind of smart. Some of them I'm just gonna bring up right now. How many of you know what a swaption is? <laughs> a swaption. Much less a Bermuda swaption. Well, there are flippers. <laughs> Another one is what they call a put swaption or a call swaption. Now, these are incredibly important because one of them is you are trading on a fixed interest rate, but the lender you're borrowing from is giving you a variable interest rate. 
And the other one is the opposite. Put call. And for them, they just knew this. It was a phrase they were throwing out. Kind of like when we walk into a place and say SQL, we know what that means, hopefully, right? Structure, <laughs> nope. okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> I'd be surprised the interviews I've been on. Anyway, um, so they kind of have to know that. They just know it, they throw it out there. But it's incredibly important to their business and it's base knowledge they have to have. And we were building software to help them do their job. So, how did we do that? As a tester, my job is to get inside the mind of our customers. My job is to be the voice of the customer, to act what I used to call the Lorax, and I would stand for the customers. In the middle of the room, I was the one saying uh, the old phrase, uh, somebody was joking about this, saying that one of the reasons why some of the early ideas to put Bluetooth into a car was a bad idea is because they used to sync your contacts as soon as you got in, and maybe not everybody in the world wanted every passenger to know who was in their contact list when they got into a car, because it would all be right there. My job as a tester was to be that guy who says that, yeah, maybe that's the case, and admit that maybe some people were hiding secrets from each other, but that was a value to them. I can understand that person. I can understand them when I was working with video games, because it's a, such a wide swath that I can start to understand them. And, and kind of get to know them. When I was working at at and Wireless, I could kind of understand our customers there. These people were operating at a whole different level than me. So how we began dealing with that problem there, um, and I'm sort of, okay, also I'm gonna go into how we did it wrong, and then I'm gonna go into kind of how I think we're doing it right right now where I am as a blatant plug for my company. I have business cards. Um, <laughs> One of the things that we used to do, okay, let me just move these over. One of the things we used to do was our old friend, the detailed design specification. So very smart people would sit in a room with other very smart people, who, by the way, whose time was also very, very valuable. If you think a senior Ruby engineer, his time is valuable, talk to somebody who is a bond trader for other bond traders. They are, they are up at four o'clock in the morning because they are now making $1,000 an hour by sitting there, at least. And Lord knows that's just the ones who would tell me what they made. So their time is incredibly valuable and if they're not making money for the company, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So they had gotten in a room with very smart people and walked through the value statements and what they expected wrote detailed design documents and handed them down to us from on high, which then we would get. The other thing they would do on the other side of it was a lot of rounds of alpha and beta testing. We would buy into people who were usually the forward thinkers of technology and say, we're gonna sit in a room, we're gonna walk through this product we just built for you and you tell me if it works or not. Uh, and we had to schedule this time out and we couldn't just have an XP model that sitting with us because again, $1,000 an hour. Um, and it was sort of, if this starts to look familiar to anybody, please raise your hand. Yeah? Kind of feels kind of waterfall-y. Doesn't it? A little bit? So this is what we were doing. We were answering that question. And this is kind of like, I began to realize this is where waterfall comes from. It doesn't come from people sitting around saying, hey, Let's just show up and do our work that I'm told to do. It starts happening because people don't understand what they're doing and they don't know how to get that information, so they begin doing this. They're saying, what do I know? What are my known knowns? What do I know? How can I fill in the gaps of what I don't know, of what I know? So you start doing that. That's also when you fill in, and then that, put up a gap that we had, which is between the technical people who were bond traders and the engineers who were building it. So they filled that gap with product managers. <laughs> oh, you're laughing, you should. <laughs> These were people, in all fairness, they were very smart people, they were very motivated, but they were kind of the people who weren't successful in one or the other. So they were kind of trying to find a mid path between the two. We had beer, you should have been here. <laughs> um, and that's who was also driving the projects 
people who didn't quite understand the bond traders, people who didn't quite understand what we did. They were the ones in charge of us now. And because that was kind of inherently risky, because we were never quite sure in the middle whether we were getting it right or not, because they didn't quite understand fully, but they understood better than us, and didn't quite be able to communicate back to the people because they didn't quite understand what we were doing, they began to severely limit the changes we would make. So things like off-the-shelf software that seemed safe suddenly became a viable option. Because it's been vetted, it's been through, people know how to use it. It's, and we began to customize it probably much further than you ever should off-the-shelf software because that was it, a, a risk for going back to the known known. We know the software, we know it works, we know it's better, so we'll just keep using it. Where it doesn't work, we'll change it. But small, <laughs> small little change. Small little change. Small little change. You eventually get to the point where it's no longer the software anymore, but it is because you're paying a license for it. So that's how we were kind of didn't really work. And eventually what ended up happening with this company is a lot of the development work got pushed off because people realized that we're really not building software, we're just sort of doing support maintenance. And there's people out there who are much better and much cheaper and can do it 24 seven. So that's what ended up happening there. Next up, okay, not next up, but I did, I did a bunch of stuff. I went back into software, because that burned me. I'm like, I'm never stepping outside of software again. This is safe. Mm -hmm. I love it. Uh, so I got into digital media. I got into, well, what else I did? Oh, digital media where I met Tanya, by the way. Um, and then I fell into this sort of round of getting back into the consulting and contracting world, which is where I met Cordev. Um, but I just had a family. Um, well, my wife had them. I was just kind of there <laughs> cleaning up. Um, and I thought well, I wanted to get back into building something. And a friend that I used to work with at the multimedia company recruited me for a company called Accelerus in 2010. Accelerus is a company you probably never heard of unless you happen to be in small molecule non-organic chemical research. A show of hands? <laughs> Anyone? Okay, well, it's kind of a joke, but they are, but they sell software to everyone from Eli Lilly to Pfizer to pretty much everybody involved in chemical research is probably using one of their products. So they're, they're actually big in their niche market. The trouble is, what are we back to? Small molecule, not inorganic chemistry. They are building products for incredibly smart people, for Nobel laureates, who are working in chemistry labs. We're back to the known unknowns. I know I don't know that. I really don't know how a chemistry lab works. I really don't. Nor do I understand it. So, here's your little primer, what I gleaned in my year and a half at Accelerus. Most of what a chemistry experiment is, is this. You start with A, you add 0 0.001 microns, 0 0.002 microns, 0 0.003 microns, and you record the results of that mixture. Again, and again, and again, and again. This seems like a, a problem that computers can solve pretty quickly, doesn't it? Because this used to be in like notebook pads. People would write this down in a, in a physical notebook and keep it somewhere. When you ever hear about a scientist's notes, that's what these are. So this, if you learn nothing else tonight, that's what this is. When somebody says a scientist's notes, it's a record of one small change that they did to a known procedure or a known process to see what happened. It's a very conservative market, but the trouble is you have to know how this is going to be set up. You can't just use an Excel spreadsheet and say, I'm just going to pull this down and do whatever. You have to say, how is somebody going to set this, this experiment up? What seems likely? Microns, millimicrons, cesium. How are they going to do this? Plus, we had modeling software for three-dimensional modeling of the, of the actual molecules involved. 
but we won't even talk because I wasn't working that project. Thankfully, we're not going to talk about that. We're just going to talk about everything that set this up. So how did we do that? How did we get something that's useful, for somebody with a PhD in chemistry, to be working using our product and say, I like that, it's valuable? They took a little bit different tactic at uh, Accelerus. They had identified product owners. Now what these people were, they were actually multifaceted. These were people who were involved in the chemistry industry, both as a sale, for former salespeople, lab assistants, but they also hired some very smart chemists to come into the company who maybe were academics or something of that nature and brought them in house as our own personal brain trust. So we gave them the money to do their own research. We let them use our products. It was almost like a dog fooding process for us to be doing that. Trouble is, we were in San Ramon, California, which if you've never been there, you're not missing much. Um, it's in the middle of the Heartland Valley, just outside of San Francisco. Culturally, way outside of San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you've been there. <laughs> uh, they, actually have, they actually erect giant Rush Limbaugh billboards just to drive us away so we won't cross <laughs> that barrier. The people who were doing this were all in their own company in San Diego because they're not software developers. So meeting with them took time, took energy. So what happened? We got the project managers in the game. They would be the ones stepping in to say, we're gonna, we're gonna negotiate time with them, we're gonna help you communicate, we're gonna do whatever. And once again, they were the people who were kind of steeped in this. They had some training in chemistry, maybe a bachelor's degree, they had done some work in a lab, but they also knew software. So they were kind of moving back and forth between the two worlds. But again, we had this problem of communication. And the other problem we had is we're a large company. We began to compartmentalize our product offerings. I think I'm losing my beer here. Do you want to have No, I think there's a hole in it. I probably should just put it over here. We'll just set it down. Oh, it did? Okay. You're, you're good. <laughs> I am so glad this is all on video. It's going to be a great show. <laughs> Daddy, why do you smell like beer? Well, this is why. <laughs> so, where was it? Okay. So, as the products began to form, and because of these barriers, the products became very compartmentalized. As I said before, an intrinsic part of what we were building was the ability to model ahead of time what, the, what, what we thought the experiment was going to look like, yet it was a completely different team in a completely different area. Well, thank you. Working on it. Because they had the people who knew about that system and what it would look like, and so they had the ability to work on it. We had a different system, so we kind of broke it apart. So what, what, that's obviously kind of cool. It's like, what, going back to the known knowns. What are we really, really good at as engineers? We take complex problems, we break them into component pieces, and we solve those little pieces, and then put them back together, and I hope to God to solve the big problem. That's what we were doing to solve this. We said, we also don't know the whole flow from start to finish for doing this research. So we're gonna break it apart into pieces we can wrap our heads around and do that. So, how did that work out? Obviously I'm not there anymore, but similar thing happened. Uh, because they were compartmentalized, because the knowledge was being kept outside of everything, because the people who were doing the quote-unquote real work didn't feel like they were part of the team, the team that was building the software became devalued. We were providing tools for somebody else to do the real work. So we became support. We became people who were responding to Eli Lilly. And honestly, when Eli Lilly calls you up and says, please give us that, you do. <laughs> they have very, very deep pockets. <laughs> and they can write some checks with the a lot of zeros behind it. So you do that. And then you offer them support, and they accept it, and then you have a guaranteed income stream for a long time, which is a known no. You now have a customer that's interacting with you, giving you money to do that, and you make money 
but it sort of turns us into support for them. So somebody again, some bright person realized that's what we were doing, and there are places around the world and teams that can do that that are built for that and not for developing software. The way it went. I've got some really good friends who are currently searching for work because of that. So that was in 2010. So, so far we've tried the old waterfall method, where we go through and develop out the detailed product specifications that were written by somebody else that were then translated into something that the engineers could use. We've tried the sort of distributed model. We break things into component value pieces and try to build that out and see what, how it's going to work. That brought me into a company called Medrio in around 2012. This company is still active, so there's not, no horror story here. Um, they're still going strong, as far as I know. They are a startup that is seeking to completely revolutionize how phase two and phase three clinical trial studies are done, um, both here and I believe in Europe and Asia at this point. So it's again a niche market, but it's one that every single one of you, if not yourself, owes their life to. You know somebody who owes their life to it. So the reason why drugs and devices and whatever are so expensive is because it costs so much dang money to go through these processes, to go through these studies. And the company that's trying to get anything on the market is the one that pays for it. So whenever you hear somebody say, oh, they paid for that study, everyone pays for it. If the government had to pay for that study, we'd be marching on Washington right now with pitchforks. So that would be billions of dollars going into test products that we may never get to afford to have to use. So, they're coming in and their big thing was we are going to take this process, which normally is run by enterprise software, is very expensive, very bulky, it can take a long time to switch and change what you're doing. When you've designed these studies, how are we going to do it? We're going to take that and take it online, into the web. It's going to be dynamic, it's going to be innovative, it's going to be agile. One of the problems with the, with the enterprise method for doing clinical trial studies is once you've built that thing in and locked it in, you're kind of locked. If you begin getting feedback, you begin getting data that doesn't match up with your expectations, switching that around is incredibly expensive. You've got to replan your study, you've got to resubmit it for approval, you've got to print out thousands of documents, and ship them out to some place, retrain your staff about how to redo these new processes and new protocols. It's, it's huge to do that, which is again why it's so expensive. They thought, what if we didn't actually print out documents? What if we tried to make this incredibly simple and intuitive so we didn't need to train you how to fill out the form? You would already know. What if we made this so you could do it on an iPad? You didn't have to have a ream of documents walking around as you did it. Seems pretty obvious, right? Well, the trouble is, we are back again to a bunch of software engineers stepping into a field we don't know. How many of you, I mean, you're very smart people, how many of you have ever even participated in a clinical trial study? One, okay. Fred Hutch, Seattle Cancer. Uh, oh, okay. So, Seattle Children's. Okay, were you, were you using like uh, filling out forms or were you doing a, a, a diary or how were you doing that? Uh, binders. Binders. <laughs> so, this is FDA, so oh. uh, you see where I'm going? That's why I was questioning where you're going because saying that's a great idea but then regulatory steps in until you change those processes at some point that you know what I'm saying it has to be I love I, I love you by the way so, <laughs> that was very, very curious because that was, that was one of the things that bit us yeah um, you can we had we had more protocols around document history and record retention than you will ever find and well as a certain uh, as a certain election in Florida in 2000 proved even physical documents are not really secure. We had date time stamps, we had locks on everything, we had watermarks up the wazoo, but the people who were doing the auditing, who are actually not part of the FDA usually, they're usually independent auditors that are hired, who are then interpreting the FDA regulations and what should be done. We missed them. <laughs> 
We thought of the, the FDA, we knew the FDA, and I had to verse myself in the FDA regulations, which is about as exciting as it sounds. Right. <laughs> and and because I'm the quality insurance manager, by the way. Well, by the way, this is all these things I mean throwing I say, you're now in charge of quality, go. Mr. English major. <laughs> so all so yeah, we had to familiarize ourselves with that, but we missed the auditors, so we had to backpedal really quickly and come up with processes to sort of fill them in. Um, one of the ways that we didn't hit other problems, though, was because the CEO and the founder came from that industry as a salesman, so we kind of understood it. But the trouble is, it was tribal knowledge that was in his head. As we got bigger, it was fine. Those of you been in a start, how many? Okay, how many of you have been in a startup before? How many of you have been in an early stage startup? Okay, how many people were there? Uh, my, I've been at more than one startup. So one of them, twenty people. Uh, actually, two of them, twenty people to start with. One went to over two hundred people within two years. Oh yeah, yeah. They can they can balloon, can't they? Yeah. 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 How many? Five. Five. Okay. Anybody less than five? No, because we're testers. We don't get invited. Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but the keyboard players in a rock band were brought in to fill out the sound. <laughs> so feel free to use that one. I, I wanted to catch on. Um, <laughs> But yeah, when, so when you are the five or the 20 people company, having that person who has all that tribal knowledge in their head works. Because they're right there. You can go ask them questions, say, okay, well, I don't quite understand why somebody like building out this trial study would do that. And they can tell you. They may not be the best authority, but that knowledge is right there and you can grab it. And if they don't know, they can get on the phone and call somebody who can't. Because there's, they, the reason why they got started, this company started is because they are known in the industry, they, they have money behind them. And you know, even in the Wild West, 19-year-old gets VC capital funding thing myth of the Silicon Valley, you do kind of have to know what you're doing to get a check from somebody. These aren't stupid people. So they knew him, they knew his background. You could get on the phone and call somebody. What happens when you're a 200-person company? Well, one of the interesting things that happened was the 20 to 200 people, mm -hmm. we spent that entire time reinventing our processes yeah. because what works for 20 people doesn't work for 40 people, doesn't work for 80 How accessible was that CEO? For 50 people. At, at 200, not nearly as, as much as at 20, right? Yeah. And you begin hiring for specific jobs. Oh, yeah. One of the things when you're 20 people, you, you hire for the person. And it's actually, it's a myth, but it really is. I mean, because you're, you're 20 people, you're in a room together. You, you don't want to have an idiot or somebody who, like, smells of falafel all day, <laughs> which used to be me. Um, <laughs> I cleaned that up a little bit. Uh, you, you really don't want to, you really want to hire for the person. When you become 20, 200 people, you start hiring for the job. And that's when you start running into this again. Because you're no longer, you're hiring for somebody, I see the system administrator. I get, I get. <clears throat> I've done this myself. I've caught myself doing this, walking into my, into my boss's office and saying, I just need somebody to do the right job. Just, I don't, I don't care if they can test. I really don't. I'm just tired of writing it myself at, at 3 in the morning when I have no sleep. Just give me somebody. It, um, it's amazing also the flip side of it is when you hire for a job, sometimes what you get is kind of apathy in the person where they're not going to do anything but their job. Well, you can kind of screen for that, but you're right. I mean, yeah. I mean, you can kind of screen for that a little bit, but you're, you start moving away from this idea that we all understand what we're doing. We all have access. The CEO knows us. We can go talk to them. Now there's barriers. Now there's levels between that information and what you're doing. So if you don't have that information, you lose it. It's in-house, but there are now circles around it of meetings and phone calls and things. And that can, that's one of the things that can breed apathy. People come in, join the startup. It's like, it's really exciting and sexy. And then it's a job. So, yeah, yes. So when you find yourself in a place with a very specific subject matter, which mm -hmm. we're talking about today, and you get that guy that's like, oh, uh, I do Drupal, that's my thing. You yeah. Know, set me in front of a computer, I'll do Drupal all day. Um, do, do you think you're, you're more likely to run into the problem with a guy that's not going to know or care or be interested in the subject matter? Okay, we're diverging a little bit. Sorry. Can I see a show of hands for who wants to go this way? Just no further, but just to answer that. Okay, how about no further, just answer this one question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the way we're answering that is how much Drupal do you need? How much what? How much Drupal do you need? Oh. Like I said. Can you, can you afford to have somebody who's specialized like that? 
And if you can't, you've answered your own question. So, I mean, there are places where I've been where we did need um, the guy who all they did was Ruby. Because there were two of them, and we had a lot of Ruby. So even if they wanted to do more, we probably wouldn't have let them. So it was really, really, it was a great fit to have somebody that Saturday just came in and put their headphones on and did their thing. Because there was a lot of work to do and we knew what it was. Other teams wouldn't have worked that well because they were sort of trying to figure out what they needed. And you either fall into the one thing where it's somebody else's problem or you fall into the, the fallacy of if you have a hammer, everything is fixed by a nail. So you just have to analyze your situation and say, is this appropriate or not? And if it's not, that's the hard decision to make. So, yeah. Anyway. So, that's what happened with Medgrave. Like I said, they're still going, but they have other problems with their issue where they have the typical hero culture, they've got whatever, and so the CEO is refusing to like remove the tentacles. So they're one of these companies that Clayton Christensen talked about. We talked about not completion, good to great. Put me on the spot. Anyway. <laughs> um, Colin, Red, 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 Colin, Colin, thank you. Oh, Colin, yeah. good to great. Colin. Talked about that. They will just sit and probably for the next 10 years do very well and incrementally improve and have a certain amount of the market. And it's a good company to work for. You're not gonna, you're probably not gonna be worried about going like getting fired in the next six months. But they're not breaking out because they've reached their limit of what they know and what they can know, and, what, and mostly what they can communicate to each other about that knowledge. So let that come. <laughs> um, mutual choice, we'll call it. Uh, I then went to work for some other companies, Atlanta Electronic Arts, was the chief tester person for their data group, and then got a phone call from somebody that I kind of barely knew about this company called the Climate Corporation. I'd never heard of them before. Even though I was working in big data, I'd only been there for a couple of years, so I was like, all right, well, let's check this out. And uh, looked at it. It's probably, remember I talked about the bond traders for the bond traders? I met a group geekier than them. <laughs> That's these people. These are people who, we actually have job descriptions. Let me see some of them. Um, I thought I wrote some down here. But we actually have things called a quantitative agronomist. That is an open job description we currently have. So if you know any, please tell me. <laughs> we are looking. We have. Uh, remote sensing scientists that we need to hire. We have statistical anomaly mathematicians. We have chaos theoreticians in there. I think well, we're all chaos theoreticians. We're all. <laughs> oh, please. Um, <laughs> we're in there, but then we've also got actuarials, insurance people, we've got finance people. It's like a giant melting pot of geekdom. And by geekdom, I mean people who are so focused on things they love but they just have to tell you about it. And they don't understand, you don't know about it. They'll just keep going. <laughs> and they, they actually get hurt if you don't understand them, so you just let them go. And, and it's like drinking, every day, when I first joined Microsoft back in 1998, back in Lubeck, my friend warned me with the giant piercings and tattoos, that I feel like I was drinking from a fire hose. And I thought I knew what he meant. And it seemed like that way at Microsoft. It's like that every day at Climate. Every day I walk into a meeting and I hear about soil impaction or uh, Bayesian modeling of weather patterns. Or so I'll walk in and there'll be what looks like something from Goodwill Hunting just doodled on a desk. <laughs> because somebody was bored. <laughs> so how do we approach getting the knowledge? Okay, how many people have you actually heard about me and know what climate.com does? Maybe you do, I know. <laughs> okay, well, just to, I'll just give you a quick rundown really fast. We are in the world, I, this is my standard spiel, we are in the sexy, sexy world of crop insurance. What we do, the old model of crop insurance was heavily government subsidized. It was based upon yields and reported yields. So there was a lot of room for that, uh, fraud. There was a lot of people had to do a lot of stuff. It was, it was very imprecise. 
which is why only governments can support it. There's a lot of areas of the world that don't have crop insurance because of that. We, on the other hand, are using what is probably actually really big data. We are pulling in data from 12 sources, I think, at this time, on a micro level. So within, like, say, 100 yards square, we're getting data for the weather in that specific spot all over the country. And soon to be, uh, I can tell you this now because we made the announcement, soon to be Latin America and then probably into Asia. We're getting it from multiple sources. We're getting it from weather stations. We're getting it from observation posts. We're getting it from possibly uh, temperature stations within the ocean. Right. We're getting it from Doppler radar. And we have historical data, thanks to our uh, combination with Monsanto, going back 100 years. It used, to be, it used to be 30, now we're going back 100. Because that's one of the reasons why we were happy about joining them. Because they gave us access to all this lovely, lovely data that they've been keeping around for as long as they've been around. So we take all that historical data, we t and then we start running 1,000 to 10,000 statistical models for what the weather is going to look like at that one specific spot for this coming year. And then, this is where the agronomists come in. We go through and say, what are you planting? What's the soil in that spot going to be like? And then how's that going to affect your crop? If you're planting corn, we think the maximum yield you're going to get is 35 bushels an acre for that field. And then we'll insure you against that. If there's a drought, if there's hail, if there's early frost, if there's late frost, depending on whatever the crop is, whatever the area is, we start taking money down off that. If you get below your deductible, we cut you a check. We don't care what your yield was. We honestly don't. You could have gotten 15 bushels out of that, or 105, we don't care. We, all we know is what the weather says it did, and then we'll cut you a check. And we have been in business for about seven years now, so I think we're getting it right. But that's who we're dealing with. That's our end product. So we have an end product. We have a bunch of parties involved in this that are not software developers. We have farmers who are using our product to help them use less irrigation, use less pesticides, use less fertilizers to get better yields out of the same acreage um, for very little money. So we have uh, insurance agents who are selling it to us. And one of the problems we're running into here that we didn't expect but we're finding out now is that a lot of these agents are also seed sellers. And they also sell, their biggest crop though, is something called nitrogen. That is their huge thing. One of our <coughs> goals, and if we do not do this, we are not a success, is reducing that significantly, as much to zero as we possibly can get. So, if your money is built on selling that, we have to give you another source of income. So we have to come, we have to understand you for that rate, an insurance salesman that's doing that. We have agronomists. We have mathematicians, and by mathematicians I mean real ones. <laughs> Not statisticians who run algorithms in a computer. Well, they, they are, but anyway. Um, and we have on and on and on. So, how are we doing this? And the way I think after learning all of this, how are we doing testing for that? That's right. We're sort of taking an approach to this. One of the things that we started doing, which I think is the wrong road we're going down, and like if people are on my company are watching this now, you already know, so this isn't weird. Um, we began trying to do an acceptance test driven development. So we began writing out our user stories as if they were test, runnable tests we could do, which I think is great, but it doesn't cover the gap because you have to take knowledge that's in someone's head they've gleaned over 18 years and put it into a runnable test, which you're not gonna do. You have to be able to find a way to look at a, at a, at a well, let's go back to a Bayesian spread. If I run my data through a Bayesian spread, I get a nice graph. Will my acceptance test tell me if that graph is acceptable? Not right, because it's never right. Is it acceptable? Does it look right? You can't do that from a test, from an acceptance test. So we moved away from, we're moving away from that. The, thing, the, the innovation we're sort of bringing in is we're decoupling validation and testing. 
We're moving away, we're, we're acknowledging the known unknowns. We're acknowledging we don't understand that. And we're probably not gonna find somebody who has not only a degree in quantitative agronomy to help us test it, we're probably not gonna find somebody who has experience doing it. So we had to approach this from a context standpoint. What information do they need? What are they really getting from us when they do this? They're getting data. So what are we supposed to be doing with that? We test the data. That's what we did. We're breaking that one job of the science tester into two. We're approaching it by saying, we're gonna have somebody who's very, very good at doing data validation and analysis. By taking a look at sampling spreads and saying, are we getting gaps? Are we getting whatever? Is something reversed? But this is big data again, so this isn't just I'm sitting at a SQL, at my SQL thing running it. They have to be able to find a way to do statistical sampling of the data as it comes in in petabytes. And say, is this looking right? Or is my sampling right? Let me re-experiment again. So that now we're getting to real science. But it's a different type of science. We're hiring interns from universities and colleges and giving them a chance to join us by saying, you'll help us run these. We can validate the data looks right. You tell us if the models are running in red. But joining us as software testers, though. And that then gives us, moving back to Medrio, access. That provides cross-pollination between the people who actually understand what we're doing from the science with the people who understand the technology. So I'm hoping that's, and this is also an experiment, but hoping it's the right way. By bringing these two people together, I'm hoping on the same team, I'm hoping we can do that cross-pollination and get them working together like that. So far it's working. But um, I'll probably, I'll hopefully come back in like a year or two and tell you if it worked. Or if I'm now at another company. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so that's what we're doing in a nutshell. And I apologize if I rambled on. Questions, anybody? So, if climate, you guys are the insurance broker? You guys are yes. the policy? Yes, the agents that we employ are our employees. <laughs> How uh, have your the premiums that you guys are offering diverged from your competitors? Or the most surprising thing that's happening is we're, well, we don't really have any competitors. We are the only ones offering private, private crop insurance in the world. So it's, it's, it's not a good place to be. Is there any Honestly, it's, it's really not. Because if you're the only one doing it, you don't have anybody you can measure yourself against and say, what are the other ideas, and are they doing it better than us? You're kind of whacking away through the bushes, hoping you're actually getting to the temple. So, yeah. Um, but to answer your question, one of the things that's kind of been interesting to us is that we're becoming, a lot of the farmers are using us, going back to what the farmers need. And we're also, to answer this question, I should have put a note on this. Um, we, are, we actually, we hire, we try to hire people who have, for me, um, people who come from a background that understands farmers. So you're in San Francisco or Seattle or St. Louis or Chicago now, but where'd you grow up? Did you grow up on the flatlands? Did you grow up, and uh, you'll know if you're from there, you'll know what that means. Yeah. Or did you grow up, you know, on a corn farm in Indiana or near one even? You know, do you know any farmers here? Are your grandparents farmers? Whatever. That gives you an insight that some people don't have. And it may not, it made me out the decision that says, okay, I'm gonna hire you, but it's gonna factor into my decision. And I'm gonna think, huh. So, yes. I've got a question for you. How is this sustainable at the way you're portraying it going outside of the United States? For mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. farmers, that makes sense, but now you're going aggregate farmers, multiples of Latin American farmers, Asian farmers, African farmers. Okay, it's not the same model, mold. Same thing for In what ways? Well, they don't have the same uh, environmental, weather, crops, mm -hmm. soil, uh, cultural expectations that the government's putting on how they tax stuff, so therefore the you, you kind of get into oh. the variance between all of those. So as you're bringing together this, this core group of success, now you're going out multiples of different kinds of farmers or multiples of different kinds of arguments that need to understand that area. Or you see what I'm saying? So yeah. it seems like it's not one size fits all as you start expanding out into those. So I, I'm kind of curious how that how that it, works. It kind of is. Okay. Also, 
So quick show of hands, someone's going to keep going, or should we, or, because I could also do this in a, okay, all right. Um, it kind of is, but it kind of isn't. Okay. Because one of the things that's happening now with industrial farming and with the, uh, the world of global trade is that there's not as much diversity as you would think anymore. Um, part of that is because of large companies like Monsanto, but part of it is also because of large companies like Monsanto. And I'll explain that because their business is to, I mean, I, I'll just like throw it out there for everybody who says, yes, GMOs, yeah, whatever. Um, but their main thing they do, I've actually met their genetic scientists and talked to them, and a part of us helping share their data, what they're doing about how, what data we have and what data they have would be useful. Um, it's much cheaper for them to do a hybrid of a known strain. So what, one of the things they do is they fund people to go out and look for new sources, new breeds, new whatever of plants they can use. Um, one of the things that they were talking about, one of the, uh, the disease, one of the pest resistant strains that people claim is a, is, uh, is a GMO, it's actually a crossbreed with another form of corn <coughs> that has the ability to absorb this thing from a mold. Okay. So, and that mold prevents, and when you do that, over a couple of generations, you develop this corn that this specific pest will not attack. It's like the flavor or whatever. The specific one is called the corn rootworm, and it will probably adapt another tier or two and figure out how to, how to let that actually is yummy. Because it's a really insidious little freaking plant pest. But yeah, oh, just how insidious this thing is. Farmers figured out that it had a two year cycle, that it would lay its eggs, wait, and the next year it would plant it. So they began planting soy and whatever. The bugs figured that out and began changing their mating cycle. <laughs> to match how they rotate the crops, even in the same field. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's what farmers are up against. Nature. Oh, wow. <laughs> Nature in its great, wonderful way of doing things. So, the economies of scale has all, all kind of but, already been in front of you now, and you're just being fast followers on the Yeah, the, the only, yeah, so the, they've already done the work for us about going out and doing this. So we have to develop models, but we do have phenology models we have to build for how things are going to do. But the big thing is the weather. <clears throat> Because one of the things that we have that's really nice in Europe and the United States is we have a lot of weather stations. We have Doppler radar almost everywhere. We have listening posts. I, I bet you we could walk out right now and we could probably find one or two weather stations. Not just because UW is there, but there's in most major urban centers, there are a bunch of them. Not so much in, in Argentina. So we have to, one, that's one of the issues, I'm kind of glad you brought that up, because one of the things that we have to test for when we're doing this, why we have to hire people who can separate those two out, the data validation. Because if you get gaps in, what's an acceptable gap? If I don't have weather data for July 17th, 2012, can I just extrapolate that July 16th and July 18th, we'll just put them together and say, well, just assume it's the same. But what happens if it's a two-day gap, three-day gap, four-day gap? Can we still keep stitching it together in a Jurassic Park kind of way with frog DNA? <laughs> or, I mean, where, where is that boundary? And I need people who can think like that. You can say, what happens to the models if we have gaps? What happens to the models if we have unexpected things happen? Because um, it's going to happen. And it, it is built into the system when you move into places like the Ukraine or Argentina or Brazil or Mongolia. So, I'm just saying, right away, Mongolia. In third world countries, are they going to have accessibility to technology to look at the data? applications that you're going to be selling them for the insurance? Yes. One of the interesting things about a lot of these countries is that we call them third world, but they're actually, I call them hopscotch, because a lot of them have jumped over. So they, they may not have landlines, they may not have like, you know, television antennas, but there are smartphones, there are tablets, there are three, they, a lot of, the, some of the places actually have better 4G than we do. Because of because of our monopolies and anyway, no, that's not the subject. Um, they actually have better wireless service than we do. Um, there are other areas like power is kind of dicey, electricity, in some of those areas and things. But they they're no more resourceful than we are, so they come up with ways to get around that. It's just yeah, I it's it's always amazing to me to go to some of these places and see. Like discrepancies, like, oh, they don't have this, but yet there's a four-year-old with the iPhone. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't think that the technology barrier is going to be a problem. 
So I think the lack of infrastructure and I think the cultural one is a big one too. Have you branched out already to those? I still? Read, the, read the press releases. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, you and them. All right. So uh, you said you were hacking through the jungle, hopefully getting to the temple. Yeah. The, uh, you know, uh, El Dorado, where you found the pot of gold. So we'll hope it's El Dorado. Like it, yeah. it, 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 it may be the. It could be the wild route right? yeah. Is uh, you're hacking through the jungle and you're going to go to a cliff. In other words, there are probably some major pitfalls, especially when you're doing statistical uh, mm -hmm. related items and, and dealing with insuring, where you have taken on a, 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 a real liability. What <coughs> steps are you guys taking and what sort of processes are you putting in place to help detect those high risks or those uh, pitfalls, given the fact that you're in the middle of the jungle, you, you don't really have clear eyes, clear eyes on all the areas. Yeah, that, that's an incredibly good question. Thank you. And I'm not just saying that so I can have time to think. Um, <laughs> it's, well, yes, you're right. I mean, in a certain way, we are trailblazing, but like any truly thing, anything truly innovative, we are not really doing something innovative. These, these questions about insurance have been answered. These questions about weather prediction have been answered. These questions about statistical analysis have been answered. These questions about actuarial tables have been answered. We're just applying them in a new way in a different industry. So, yeah, so we are mitigating our risk to a large extent by not grabbing onto the bread, showing this newest thing out there. Mm -hmm. We're using an established thing. We are applying them in a new way. So it's kind of scary that way. Um, and it's scary for our customers yeah. who are incredibly risk averse because as somebody, a friend of mine once told me, a farmer gets 40 seasons they're lucky to get it right. That's it. Imagine if you had 40 product launches and you were dead. That's all you get. That's what a farmer has. So they get very, very risk averse. And on top of that, if you don't get the first five right, you're done. Mm -hmm. Or they're looking for a way to legally pull finances out of a company that yeah. they might be able to There's, do. there's so some I mean, of there's, that. There's, there's, a, there's some legal risk there. there, there there's some of that. There's some things you have to prevent against fraud and things, but yes. for the most yeah. part, people are not going to defraud you. And I mean, well, once some, well, our system is kind of built around the idea that it's, it's very, very difficult to defraud us because how do you fake hail? I mean, I can, but I know the system. <laughs> but how, do you, how does a farmer using an iPhone fake that it hailed over three of their crops now they get a check? Um, the old system was actually a lot more prone to fraud because they could just claim that they'd only harvested X number of bushels and then go to another well, they go to granary the, cell that was run by a friend of theirs. They, and, they, they, go, they go to the weather station that's planted out between the three farmers uh, lots of them. Yeah, but then it goes to a risk reward. It goes to a risk reward thing at that point. If you're going out there and doing that, then you're like, well, how much am I really getting out of this? So the big thing for us is we have to be able to prove that we can do what we do, that it's worth their money, that they have these established methods for applying nitrogen, for doing crop rotation, for using a certain tools to plant it. And they know it'll work because they've done it before, and now we're coming in with something new. So that's our biggest risk, is helping them see that happen and then be right. right. Because if we're not right, we go out of business. Or if they don't believe you or don't trust you, then they don't buy it. Yeah. Likewise. Luckily, the Monsanto has helped us like abate that a little bit. So, what, what, yeah. so what's your success rate versus the Farmer's Almanac? Um, that's, yeah. that's one of the yeah. questions. Yeah. 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 What's yeah. amazing about it is how often the Farmer's Almanac nails it. And it's like, wow, it's so unsigned. That's actually, a, that's actually an apples to koalas question because the Farmer's <laughs> Almanac is not that local. A Far yeah. farmer can't go out to the feed store and buy a, a, a farmer's almanac for their field. So it Whereas was, they can it was, with us. It was, ex it was exactly so, right in one area okay. where it was, it, was exa <laughs> it, was, it was right in a journal sense. And the farmer's almanac also says, we think it's going to be like this in this area for this time, which is a question we've been able to answer for quite a while. So, so they're vague enough that. Yeah. And also, the other thing that's happening, which is actually causing the farmer's almanac to deviate, is a little something that certain news channels like to deny is happening which is uh, weather craziness. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not going to use the term. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to walk into it, no. Um, but we've got weather craziness happening, and that's one of the reasons why we became a company. The first incarnation of this company is called Weatherbill, and it was, uh, we had a deal with Expedia to provide 
I, I actually joked that the CEO watched, I think it was Superman 2 or 3, and got the idea for this joke. Uh, for this company, but you can take out insurance. You can take out insurance against your vacation that the weather would be good. Oh wow! And if you went to Aruba or something and the weather was crappy or there was a hurricane, you would get money for the insurance for that. <laughs> didn't really work so well. It was not really a money maker. But then farmers, when the people we just began to look, they began to look around and say, "What else can we do with this?" Um, and found crop insurance. Awesome, interesting. Yes, and then we'll come back to you. Sorry, yeah. Cool. So you had described um, having multiple, you know, a dozen sources for say 100 square foot plot of land, and mm -hmm. you talked about running uh, well, some of them for the specific plot of land, but yeah. Sure. No, so so you, did, I believe you said like around a thousand models. Do you guys mm -hmm. have multiple models, or is it no, no simulations? Simulations with the anywhere. Actually, we're running between two and ten thousand simulations. Right. Against it, using different models. Dif okay, so yeah. it is different models. Yeah, we have models that check the models. Okay. So that's one of the ways we do risk averse as well. We don't just use one specific model. We run it through using a couple of different methods, which is actually pretty standard in this type of mathematical model. You don't just rely upon one algorithm. You, you run it through a few times and see if they diverge or deviate from each other in the ways that are unexpected. You go, okay, something's wrong. Yeah. Um, that's actually some of the interesting part of what we do for testing is we sort of come up with how we can make that go wrong. Like mm -hmm. one of my testers that I love him, I'm probably gonna give him a bonus. He found a way that you can like fudge the system and make it so you will always get a check from us. Because your deductible is now negative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I want him doing my taxes. Um, <laughs> but the math was right. That's what the model should have done. It should have had a negative for the estimation for bushels and things during the using the model just how we processed it wasn't right later down the field. Mm -hmm. So this fact goes back to a system thinking chaos type of idea. How can, I, how can every single piece be right yet wrong mm -hmm. at the same time? And that's what he found. He found a case where every single little piece was right, did what it was supposed to do, and was so very wrong at the end. So yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, did I answer your question? Yeah. OK. So I, uh, my name is Chris, and I work in infectious disease modeling. Ooh. Ooh. So, um, we actually might want to talk to you because we're, 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 we're breaking into uh, like uh, pest outbreaks and uh, yep. things like that. Yeah, it sounds really funny. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what you we said earlier that I found really fascinating was the idea of breaking apart validation and testing. Mm -hmm. And in your context, I think what you were suggesting is that in validation, you're just like, I've got you know a bunch of petabytes of data, and I need to make sure that the data is good. And you have testers who hire subject matter experts, and they're looking at the model to make sure the models work. Yeah. Um, what I'm curious is the places where there's a little bit of bleed over. So uh, let's take what, what was the what was the pest for uh, that you mentioned for corn the root. Oh, the uh, the corn rootworm. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, it, you could imagine easily that you might have your model and you've got some sort of parameter you turn off and on about enable rootworm, and then you could say I want a little of them or a whole lot of them, and you can run a model and see that it you know basically does what you'd expect. So if there's no rootworm, you get some sort of yield. If you have a, a few, it's a little less, and a lot, and it's a lot less. And at some point, you sort of shrug your shoulders and say, that sounds like I've actually done like an acceptance level of testing. I can hand that off to somebody. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it, you're finding yourself in a situation where you're actually sort of looking at the science, even if it's just a tiny bit of it. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you guys manage breaking that part? Or did I just give you a free segue to your next thing? No, 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 you didn't. I actually brought it up, but I'll bring it up again. Okay. <laughs> and that's, I'll do it again. I don't care. <laughs> Herring. This is a question that was asked to me by the, uh, by the guy who's now the VP uh, or the chief technology officer for the company. Um, he asked me, so should we have an independent test department? And it took me a little while. I, I don't, I, people who know me say I don't like to jump in with the, and say yes or no to those questions. Because every context is different. Every situation is different. Um, I've worked, oh, again, I was the sole tester for the data group at Electronic Arts. Um, out of, I think when I left, there were 68 developer engineers working on it, and I was one of me. And that worked for them because of what they were doing and what their Thing was doing. I've also been, I've also had another place, a team that I was managing of 
12 local people and 47-ish because in some areas of the world the thing is fluctuates a lot. Um, and just doing that, we had I think like 10 or 12 developers. So how should it work? I don't know. The question that I asked, do we have a separate test environment? Is that right there? Yes. Because if we didn't, the people who were doing the data validation would be sitting over there with the Hadoop guys running their MapReduce stuff and doing their stuff. Yeah, let's get Java, woo! And the scientists would be over here going, woo, Kelvin, woo! I don't know, whatever they talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and they wouldn't mingle. They wouldn't have that cross-pollination, which is the same thing we had at Medro. The people weren't talking to each other because they, were, they didn't plan their growth well and they sort of grew up around this. So it may have changed. By the way, if you're watching, it may have changed now. Please tell me if it has. Um, what we're trying to build here is that by being on the same team, attaining the same meetings, talking to each other, saying, can I help you with that? You know, yes, please, come help me run these test cases, do whatever. We'll start to have that knowledge exchange that comes along with that. So it's the same idea of pairing a developer and a tester when we're working on a project. It's like, so there will be some cross-pollination, I've seen it. It's inevitable, unless you've got the uh, Drupal guy who just wants to put on his headphones and just ignores everybody else, which you may need, I don't know. Um, but normal people, when they sit next to each other and start talking, will symbiotically start fudging knowledge between each other. And that's what I'm hoping is going to happen here with an independent test team. It may change in two years. It may say no. It doesn't make sense. We should all be part of the same Agile team where there's no testers, there's no developers, there's just engineers, and we're just doing it. <laughs> and yeah, that's why I love this type of company. I never know what's going to happen. So are you speaking of pairing in a general sense of the cross-pollination and information exchange, or do you guys literally have programmer scientists? Uh, in, in this case, it is literal pairing. In this case, they are literally sitting next to each other because the scientist or the, I don't know what to call them, the subject matter trained, I guess, would be the case here. Maybe not expert yet, but hopefully. Um, they are going to need data to run these models. And they're going to need to get the data from somewhere. Someone needs to make it. Because it's not just turning a flag on and off. It's not just going into God on the computer and saying, sword. You've got to find some way to make that stimulate. Because Halo is an easy one, or, or a past outbreak is it's somewhat easy, but there's usually a duration on it and things. Um, there's an infestation level. There's, you know, and pests are never just pests. There's always like soil and moisture and whatever that, that have effects on that. So just even that simple model of, do we have corn rootworm? You need data that's going to simulate that in a realistic manner. Somebody has to make that for you, the data person. Then that starts with, why do you need that? Oh, for this. Oh, OK. It's like, so where does that come from, that data? Oh, it comes from over here. Really? It comes from the, uh, the Farm Services Agency? Really? Oh, OK. I wouldn't have thought that. Well, why not? And then back and forth, and you get that. Just from trying to solve a problem together, this starts happening. So, we're getting a sign. Yes. Yeah. John, do you have one more question? Want to do one more and then call it good? Sure. Uh, OK. Cool. So does anybody have one more question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is a great, lively discussion. I don't mean to cut off, but I know people want to be drawing. We'll do the drawing, and then if you want to stick around for a few minutes and talk to Curtis. OK, who has the odd-sized card? <laughs> Uh-oh. Andy Fox. Andy Fox. Now we're going to do two drawings. So you, we have a $25 Starbucks gift card, and we have also this little good box of um, treats. Well, I know that my clerk will 